this is pretty exciting. Sarah Schulman with me, a novelist, a playwright, scholar, activist. You're like a lesbian Barbie. You've had so many occupations. Do I have to be Barbie? <laughs> it's not like, and the one thing she hates is being called the Barbie. I'm sure that's never <laughs> been the first, way you've been described. Absolutely. Well, it's just that she does a lot of things. What do you identify with the most? Novelist. Really? Yeah. Even though you've sort of been right in the thick of all the, like you, you put yourself right on the firing line and it's still just the solitary work of writing. I, that's what I enjoy the most. It's what you enjoy the most. Yeah. So then why put yourself in the forefront? I don't feel that I'm doing that. It's hard to explain. Uh -huh. I just I l look at a situation and think about it, and then I kind of have thoughts about it, and then I say them, and then sometimes there's a lot of reaction. <laughs> I'm serious. It just I just it just feels very normal to me. Okay. So. Uh, you're. I, I don't know if you know how unique your situation is. You've come to Toronto on one night. You will be honored for your work in shaping queer history, and on the next night, you're speaking about you know what you're, you're what you're doing now, and hopefully, we'll be doing in the future like a brand new movement or a, a movement sort of in its infancy, infancy as far as queers are concerned. Why why quiet? Why take that cause up now? Well, I came to get involved. I'm, I consider myself to be an advocate for queer Palestinians and for the global queer movement. Right. Which also includes queer Israelis who are involved in ending the occupation. Okay. And I came to it very naturally. I was invited to come speak at Tel Aviv University. A number of people made me aware that there was a Palestinian boycott of state-sponsored institutions that I didn't know about. I talked to many wonderful and interesting people who gave me a lot of time especially Judith Butler, right. gave me a lot of attention, and we talked about this. You know, it, it's, I, I know I, I was at uh, the speech where you, you mentioned that you called a lot of, you reached out, and that, that's great. Judith Butler, you said, was the first person who called you back, and Naomi Klein didn't. Never would, did. Would it have been different if Naomi had gotten to you first? Well, I think that, you know, gay people recognize each other with respect based on the work that we've done inside the community. Right. But because of that work, sometimes we are not seen by straight people in the same light. And they don't treat us with the same level of respect. So through this whole process, I called a lot of queer people who I had never met before. Right. Elle Flanders and John Grayson and people all over the place, and they all got back to me right away. Right. You know, because we recognize each other's contributions. Okay, well tell me more about, uh, um, you were invited to Tel Aviv, what okay, an so, honor. Yes. And, and, then, and then, and you had no idea, why would, you, who know so much, how is it that you missed this? How could it be that right? I didn't know about the boycott? Right. I, I just think it's because I'm American. I mean, I never, I read the newspaper every day, I consider myself to be very informed. Right. And it just, there's very little substantive discussion of Palestine, of, of the boycott, of, of anything. It's, right. Uh, you have to start looking for it to get the information. And I just never did. I was someone who really avoided Israel, thinking about Israel. I found it so upsetting. I just never really dealt with it. So. Um, and when you say Israel, you mean the fact that they've, they've created a, a wall, a separation? Not just that. Okay. The settlements. Okay. I mean, the whole cetera. history of it. Okay. Well, you know, I just, I, as, you know, I was born in 1958. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I was indoctrinated with a lot of ideas, I think innocently, by my family, right. where they saw Israel as something, you know, essential to their survival. But if you had told me or my parents in 1962 that Jewish people would go into villages and commit war crimes, uh, we would have thought you were insane. It was unimaginable. But things have changed very dramatically, and I had not kept up with it, and you know, because I think it was too emotionally challenging. Right. So uh, Judith put me in touch with someone named Dali Baum, who's a lesbian who was a mathematician, uh, who's Jewish and from Israel. And she put me in touch with other people. And it was interesting when I look at my own trajectory. I started by talking to queer Jews. That's how I began. Okay. In Israel, Canada, and the U.S. And a lot of people were telling me, you know, you really have to decline. You can't violate the boycott. It's like crossing a picket line. Of course, I've never crossed a picket line in my life. You know, and um, 
some people came up with the idea of doing a solidarity visit instead, and that really appealed to me. Right, because if you decline, then you just disengage from the conversation. Right, you, you just stay home. Do you feel conflicted home. about that? I didn't want to do that. Right. So I didn't want to undermine, certainly, Palestinian cause, but on the other hand, I didn't want to sit home and do nothing. Okay. So this idea was concocted to do a solidarity visit, and I didn't know anyone in Israel. I had no connections there. And all these people appeared from around the world to help me organize this trip. So I decided to decline publicly, which I did. And how, did, how was that received by the Tel Aviv universe? Were they like, Quaya again, our nemesis? It has nothing to do with there was. I didn't, ever, I didn't know what Quaya was. Didn't even was. know. OK, so I, what did they? I'm not affiliated with any organization, You're let not, me just say that. Okay. OK. You know, I wrote them this letter like, I'm really sorry. <laughs> because the last thing I want to do is turn my back on a, on a queer event. Right. But I really feel that I, I can't accept, but I'm going to come anyway. Okay. So that was the letter that I wrote them, and, and some of them were like, I can't believe you're doing this. And it, they didn't realize that I wasn't aware at the beginning. Huh. And so then, they thought that it was a coup to get you. Yeah. You know, so they got caught up in my own ignorance. They had to pay for that as well. Right. But then, when I came, so I did go to Tel Aviv, but I didn't speak at the university. I spoke at an anarchist vegan cafe, <laughs> okay, <laughs> called the Rogatko, which means the slingshot, you know, like David and Goliath. But I had about 60 people, and many of whom were the same people who would have been at the conference, including some of the conference organizers. And they, they, they completely understood. They're in the same quandary. I mean, you know, uh, they're, they don't know how to negotiate all of this. And the, the queer movement there, they're called the queerim. It's mm -hmm. Hebrew for the queers, whatever. Okay. And, you know, there's a, there's an, they're anti-occupation. They're separate from the LGBT community, which is what's now what Jasbir Puar calls homo-nationalist, you know, which is identified with the state. I'm going to ask you about that. You said, it, I've heard you describe homo-nationalism as the, the best word to have been coined. Yeah, the, the greatest most contribution by queer theory. Thank okay. you, Jasbir Puar, okay. for so that. She's a professor from Rutgers. Explain that. Homo nationalism is, you know, gay people are used to being on the bottom of a society. Certainly in my generation, right, I'm 52. So I've had profound oppression experiences. But in some situations, that is shifting. And we're now seeing, particularly in some Western European countries like the Netherlands and Germany, that white gay people have gotten so many rights that they now are so assimilated into the um, unequal power structures that they're identifying with the state. And we're seeing gay people taking positions that are racist, that are against uh, immigration, that oppose the, the occupation. And even in the US, in Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which is principally the right to employment, but there also was this you know, strategy of homo-nationalism, of, of defending the wars, not criticizing them, of claiming that gay people deserve recognition because we're participating in these immoral wars, no critique of the state. And that's what Jez Beer has called homo-nationalism. And it's a very, it's, it's a succinct way of explaining something that's quite complicated, but very real. Right. Do you, then the very last thing, <laughs> okay. in Toronto we have a mayor that uh, the, the downtown core certainly is no friend to the queer community. And he has refused to march in our Toronto Gay Pride I Parade hear. because he's going up to his cottage. Uh, as long as you're in town, what do you say about facilitating a little march up to cottage country? Uh, sure, I'll come along. <laughs> You'll come along? Or... But you know, the bigger lesson is why are, why are gay people in Toronto allowing city money to determine how they're going to organize their own events? Look at you, just laser focus. Here's the bigger <laughs> issue. It's true. Yeah. We don't need anyone's permission. That was the hallmark of the Lesbian Avengers. Fuck you. <laughs> we don't need permission. That's what I want. I want a little Sarah Schiff right to the camera. Fuck you. No. All right. On her. Fuck you. That's Sarah. That's, she's, she said that off camera. <laughs> you are. It's, you're calm. You're the calm lesbian. The new stereotype. The reasonable, <laughs> compassionate, curious lesbian. But haven't lesbians always been that way? I don't know, maybe it's just a personal thing. I've never been that way. But I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm glad to meet okay. one. And I'm glad to talk to you. Thank you so much Thank for you. taking the time. I really Great. appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Okay.